My earliest memory is I was floating in space and there were stars all around me and I had this complete feeling of comfort and contentment and all of a sudden I started getting pulled backwards. And I've remembered that longer than anything I know. And I believe that was the moment before I was born. The thing that impressed me about Mike, from the time he was a small kid, he was obsessed with art. And I think there was a lot of, here you are, a university professor, and your son is a tattooist. And my feeling would be my son's a wonderful individual, he's a great artist, and he's doing art that people are prepared to pay for and pay handsomely, so what's wrong with that? People respect Mike tremendously and, and they are very thankful. People are genuine and they're happy to receive what Mike is able to do with them. Mike was born about two weeks too late. He was post-mature and I don't know if you've seen a post-mature baby but they're pretty ugly. <laughs> he was born in Vancouver and we were about to move back to London because of my work and so it's true that for the first couple of weeks of Mike's life he slept in the upper uh, dresser drawer because we didn't have a, a, a bassinet for him, but he survived that. My father is my best friend. He and I have traveled across North America two or three times together. The first time I think I was maybe three years old, I still remember it. I remember driving through the Rockies. I remember sitting in the back of the Country Squire station wagon. He moved a lot. And he was a great travel companion. He would sit in the back of the uh, station wagon singing O Candela. And uh, <laughs> the only time he got annoyed was I picked up a young guy who was hitchhiking out of uh, Tobermory, and Mike didn't want this kid in the car, so he was quite <laughs> obnoxious with him. And so finally the guy got out, and then Mike was happy again. I've always tried to emulate my dad. If he did something, I'd do it. He was eating apples and he would eat the whole thing, he'd eat the core, so I thought, I'm going to do that. And <laughs> so I did, and it was hard to eat the core when you were a little kid, but I choked it down. I asked him, like, what do you, why do you do that? And that's what he did, right? So I started, and I still do it to this day. I have two brothers, three sisters. We used to call ourselves the big kids and the little kids. The big kids were myself and my two sisters. The little kids were my two brothers and my youngest sister. I was kind of the trailblazing older sibling. I did all the stuff first and usually got in trouble for it, but it kind of broke the ice and made it easier for the other siblings after me to do the same thing and get away with it or, or maybe not quite get in as much trouble as I did. I didn't really like being in the city too much. When I was around eight or nine and experienced bullying for the first time, didn't really know how to deal with it and tried to come to terms with it like peacefully, not fighting because I've never really been a, a fighter. I don't even know how to fight. It didn't work and, and I just felt hopeless. Whether it's because there were five other kids, I, I think I have to say I wasn't maybe sensitive to some of the issues that Michael had and, and in retrospect I feel both guilty and, and bad about it. I don't think I really enjoyed school until we moved out to Melbourne in 1978 and everything changed. Before I went off to high school, just living at the farm, I used to hunt, I used to trap. I don't do that anymore, I don't, I don't kill. I don't even like killing insects. But at one point in my life I thought that the world, <laughs> the world was probably gonna come to an end and I was gonna have to learn how to survive out in the woods. So that's why I did it, you know? But those are the best days. Arrowhead hunting, camping, enjoying the summer, enjoying the winter, snowshoeing, just being outdoors, being outdoors with my friends and, and exploring the area that, that I live, I still live. I, I know the area around my old hometown very intimately, like all the forests, the fields, the streams, everything, because I walked every square inch of it. My great-grandmother actually was quite artistic, and I think that a lot of it got passed down on her side. She was a silversmith, she was a taxidermist, she was very, very creative. 
My dad also is very artistic as well. I'm a, a mediocre artist, and so I recognized that he had much more ability than me, and so I wanted to encourage him. I would have been happy if he had sort of gone into doing art as a profession, gone to you know the University of Toronto or something like that. I've been putting stuff on paper for as long as I can remember. It's just something I've always, always done. Not only was he obsessed with art, but he had an amazing recall. I remember one time we were driving down a street and there was different houses along the way and we got home. And he said to me, do you remember that yellow house with a blue roof? And I mean, I was having difficulty remembering, but he had remembered it sort of in its entirety. I never wanted to be a tattooist. I wanted to be an archeologist. I love history. If I could go back in time, I would probably go back in time to this very spot that I'm in right now, and I go back about 200 years to the War of 1812. It was a major conflict that took place in this area, and the Americans destroyed the uh, economics of this area for a long time. They burned all the mills, they murdered people, they stole, they destroyed orchards. It was, it was terrible. It just threw the whole area into, into conflict. And, but at the same time, it's such a terrible time. But for me, I've been fascinated with it. I think the people that I call my friends, they come from all walks of life. I'm attracted to, to unusual people that are attracted to unusual things. It was awesome. Living on a farm, I met Mr. Deller, who was a really cool teacher, had a big influence in my life. He is an extraordinary person. He is super intelligent. He's an archeologist, he's a teacher. He used to encourage kids to go out and look for artifacts in the fields. And we would bring them in on Monday morning and, and he would tell us what they were. He knew the age of them. Some very important uh, prehistoric sites were discovered because of this. He got me interested in antique guns, he got me interested in swords, the War of 1812, like a lot of things that are really important to me, I think were, uh, the seeds were planted by him. And I'm still, still his friend, I mean, he's the oldest friend I have. I think of collecting as a superpower, not a disorder. I have a passion for history, for things that are old, because they have a story, they're a connection to uh, a time that's long gone. You know, sometimes they're the only thing left to remind you of that. And I like to be surrounded by old stuff. I started collecting arrowheads when I was probably 10 years old. My dad collected them before me. Muskets, swords, canes, taxidermy, coffins, Inui artifacts, stones, chickens, like everything. A lot of people are creeped out by the skulls and we've got them upstairs in our bedroom. They're everywhere. I don't know what it is. You're either a collector or you're not. And a lot of people are minimalist, but that to me is like so fucking boring. Like how can you not have anything around you, you know? I first started metal detecting when I was probably about 12 years old out in Melbourne with an old gentleman by the name of Bill Campbell. He was Melbourne's sort of unofficial historian. He knew all the old lore of Melbourne. He knew where all the old locations were. And he had these two metal detectors and I used to go out metal detecting with him. And it was awesome. My friends thought I was nuts. They wanted to go out and play and goof off. I was out metal detecting with Bill. And we, we would go all over the place. I'm gonna be 50 this year and I'm still doing it. I was doing it today. I was doing it yesterday. You know, every chance I get, I'm out there trying to find stuff. One of the coolest things I ever found was a waist belt plate that was dropped by an American raider during the War of 1812. That is a connection to a past, to a very traumatic past that people don't even know about anymore. You know, it's long gone. There isn't a culture on this planet that doesn't have some sort of a tradition of body modification. I believe that tattooing has been with us ever since we lost our protective covering of hair. It just makes sense. I'm sure the Neanderthals were heavily tattooed. Life revolved around 
the hearth, the fire pit, you know, and they would have been butchering animals, working with sharp things, cutting themselves, getting ashes in their skin. It would have healed up and they would have noticed, hey, that's a really cool way to leave a permanent mark. I think the oldest tattooed body that we have is Utsi the Iceman, and he's like 5,000 years old. But tattooing goes way, way back. I got into tattooing as a way of making money, but it wasn't something that I ever planned on sticking with because all the tattoos that I saw, to me, were very basic and, and simple. And I didn't think that you could do a lot with the medium. The defining moment for me came when I was attending a tattoo convention in England. It was the first time I had been anywhere and seen other tattoos done by different people. Keeping in mind there's no tattoo magazines back then. So if you only saw tattoos on people's skin, you didn't see them anywhere else. And when I got to this tattoo convention, I saw incredible back pieces and sleeves. They were amazing. Guys like Mickey Sharps, Ian of Redding, Bernie Luther, Philip Lou. It was it blew my mind. I had no idea that you could do this with the medium. When I came home, I decided that's it. I'm gonna be a tattooist for real now. And I said to my dad, Dad, I don't think I'm gonna go back to school this year. I'm just gonna take it off. I'll work at the tattoo shop. And, and that was it. And he, he's like, he was fine with that. He's like, okay, Michael, yeah, that's what you wanna do. You go right ahead. Transitioning from paper to skin was terrifying. I remember my boss, the man that taught me how to tattoo Frank, I remember him telling me that I would be nervous for the first 100 tattoos. And he was right like scared shitless. The stuff is permanent, you know? And you, <laughs> you're, you're putting it on something that won't sit still, something that bleeds, something that cries, and it's anxiety inducing for sure. I'm still intimidated by tattooing. Every day there's a new challenge. You always see where you can improve. That's where the focus is, not what you can do, it's what you can't do. So tattooing for me is is still challenging. It's not as challenging, obviously, as it was 30 years ago, but it's still pretty friggin' challenging. I opened my tattoo shop August 4th, 1992. And when I did open it up, it was one of the only custom tattoo studios in the country, and certainly in this area. I've been a tattooist for over 30 years now, longer than I haven't been. I had just moved into London. I needed a job, so I went looking for a job. Somebody told me they were hiring dishwashers at the Great West Steakhouse. So I went in there and applied, and they told me they wouldn't hire me because my hair was too long, right? And I said, well, I'll wear a hairnet. And they said, nope, no, if you want to wash dishes here, you got to cut your hair. And I thought, like, fuck, I'm not looking for a career as a dishwasher. I'm just looking for a, a job, right, to get through the summer. So I said, fuck that. And I went down the street, and the very next place I went into was the Blue Dragon Tattoo Company on Wellington, the original one. So Mike used to make extra money by going after school and doing flash, because many tattooists, even today, are not good artists. So Mike would do this flash, which people could get off the, the wall, and he would get, I don't know, five or ten dollars per piece. And then Frank decided to train him, and that's how he got into tattooing. A lot of really important things happened to me in that old building that dated from 1855. I met my wife in there, like 20 years before I ever married her. I did her first tattoo. I miss it. I miss that place. I really do. I miss those days. To me, those were some of the best of times, and I didn't even know it at the time. I think the reason that I've been so successful is because I had the talent, but more importantly than that, I had the right teachers. The Dutchman, who is one of the greatest tattooers there's ever been and ever will be, he was a trendsetter, he was uh, so innovative, and, uh, and he was also one of my teachers, which was pretty awesome. Teachers help focus you and send you in the, in the right direction. We always say in tattooing that we're standing on the shoulders of the guys who came before us. Around here, my name comes in conversations about tattooing mostly because I've been doing it longer than anybody else. My husband has celebrity. He, he is. I mean, people always want to talk about tattoos. Most tattooers traditionally were older men. 
There weren't a lot of young people doing it. I remember going to the Dunstable Tattoo Convention in 1988, I think it was, and I was the youngest guy there. You know, I was the youngest guy. I was, I guess I was 18. Now I go to tattoo conventions and I'm one of the fucking oldest guys there. When I started tattooing, we made our own needles. We made our own needle bars. We had just started wearing gloves. There was no internet. You had to have a huge collection of books for reference material. There was no tattoo magazines. If you wanted to learn something, you actually had to travel and hope that that person that you were hoping to learn from took an interest in you or just didn't tell you to go fuck off. Every little grain of knowledge that you got back 20 or 30 years ago, you were very grateful for. It was very hard earned. You had to really go after it. There was no easy way of doing it. I've always found tattooing a struggle. There's always something, it could be a client, it could be your machines aren't working properly, it could be any one of a number of things. It's never easy. You have to wear a lot of hats when you're a tattooer. You're working intimately with people, marking their bodies, so you have to deal with all the fun that comes with that. I mean, they'll have an allergic reaction to something, or, or it's hurting and they're not staying still. Or, or any one of a number of things. It's, it's f forever a challenge. Seeing it on the skin when it's all healed up, that is why I do it. The clients being appreciative, that's a bonus, that's awesome. The designing it, I enjoy that, but all that stuff pales in comparison to when it's finally done and you see it on the skin. Because you've created something and then you send it out into the world. <laughs> He's a good tattooist. He listens. He listens really well. He can get people to say things and get their ideas on paper really well. I think Mike's different from the average sort of working person in that he tends to really care about people. I think he's a very sensitive uh, individual. I mean, when people look at him, they think, you know, this is some motorbike <laughs> bicyclist. But he's not. He's a very sensitive person. He's very kind and uh, he reminds me of the Pied Piper of Hamelin. Whenever there's kids around, they all gravitate to Mike and follow Mike. And I mean, I think it's, it's tragic that Michael has no children, but I think he would have been a wonderful father. People, young and old, like to be around Mike because he's just a genuine, awesome, loving, kind, generous person. He's the best storyteller. He's the best Uncle Mike anybody could ever have and he's warm and he's funny and yeah there's a lot of reasons why people like to be around Mike. I've always wanted my children to be in some respect a better person and I think Mike number one is a better artist than me but I think that Mike is a better person than me. I think Mike is a, a genuinely kind person, more kind than I am, less critical than I am and I have to admire him for that. He has so many interesting uh, hobbies and things that he does. Tattooing is only a part of who Mike is, so he doesn't focus on that 24-7. We're all made of the same thing. Everybody, everything, every living thing on this planet is composed of the same elements. We're all the same. We're all interconnected. I believe that. I know it's true. When we die, we just get recycled back into it, our energy, our bodies, everything. We have to take care of this planet because it's all we have. At one point in time, everyone knew who Farley Moa was. I read Never Cry Wolf, which is one of 50 some odd books that he wrote. He wrote a book a year, I think almost until the end of his life. But Never Cry Wolf was really special to me, very compelling. And it's the story of Farley Mowat when he's a young man, he's just out of university. He goes up north, the government wants to know why the caribou are dying, and they want to blame it on the wolves. So he goes up there and discovers that it's not the wolves, it's human beings once again. They're killing them like crazy, and they're not only killing the wolves, they're killing the caribou, they're destroying the caribou herds. He talks about a river where the natives, they, they got rifles and the caribou used to swim across this river and the natives would just sit there and shoot them and shoot them. And the, the whole bottom of the river was a forest of caribou antlers. So, it was, but it's not just the natives, it was everybody, right? It's human beings. I read Never Cry Wolf and I wrote Farley a letter. 
And I asked my mom, how long would it take to get a response? And she said, probably two or three weeks. So I waited. And after about three weeks, I started going down to the mailbox at the end of the lane. We lived on a farm, it was a long laneway. And I went down there every day for like three weeks looking for this letter. And I remember the day I decided, this is the last time I'm going down there. He hasn't answered me or anything. So I walked all the way down the laneway. The little flag was up on the mailbox. And I reached in and I pulled out a letter and it had my name on it. It said, Mr. Mike Austin. And it was a little tiny letter. And I remember and I flipped it around and it had Farley Mowat stamped on the back of it. And I freaked. I flipped out. I ran all the way back. I would draw cartoons. I would send him arrowheads and fossils and things that I found, and he would write me back. So we formed a friendship through correspondence. We were pen pals. And I still have every single letter he ever wrote me. I started writing him when I was 11, and we corresponded right up until his death. My greatest accomplishment, I think, is what I did in the Arctic. The book and the tattooing. A momentum was started and that's going to carry on long after I'm gone. It was all about Inuit mythology. Mythical creatures, it's called the hidden. It took eight years, it was probably about a hundred drawings. And I traveled up to the Arctic quite a bit uh, in, in doing the research. It was almost like being a police sketch artist. You'd talk to elders or hunters and they would describe to you this creature that they had maybe been told about when they were a kid or maybe they had seen it, they had experienced it. I talked to people that experienced some really crazy shit out in the, you know, the middle of nowhere in a, in a tent or in an igloo. Every time I drew something, I had to show it to various indigenous people in the community to make sure I got it right or came close to it. Virtually every race has, has giant stories. The giants were there before human beings. The giants ruled the earth and then you know time passes and you know things happen and then the giants start dying off it's kind of weird it kind of reminds me of the the end of the Pleistocene period when the land around here where we're sitting right now was covered with giant creatures mastodons and ground sloths and, and giant wolves and beavers and all these giant creatures they all died off they're all gone now and it's kind of the same with the giants. They populated the planet first, then their time was over. In a lot of those stories, they, they say the giants are sleeping underneath the, the hills and the ground just formed over top of them, implying that they'll reawaken someday. We gathered these, uh, these stories and we put them in this big book. It's a big hardcover book. The illustrations are kind of like the main part of it. And we made sure that every library in the entire Arctic has a copy of it. To me, it felt like I was giving something small back to a culture that had so much taken from it. I've always been interested in indigenous cultures and mythology. So for me, yeah, it was, it was like I was giving something small back. I was maybe planting a seed that they could take and, and it's growing into something. And you know, in a hundred years, It'll be something really strong, really good. I feel good that I played a part in that. The person in my life that has had the biggest change on me is probably my wife. She's a really amazing person. I probably don't tell her that enough. But yeah, she inspires me all the time. I never thought that I'd ever be married. And I think that's because my parents' marriage broke up my mom wasn't happy. Yeah, that was just a really shitty fucking time. It really was. I really focused on my art and tattooing. It's almost like I became married to tattooing. I pursued that very seriously and very heavily. Um, and I guess I didn't get distracted like a lot of other guys I know. You know, they got married, they had young families and kids and they couldn't devote all their time to their craft because they had family responsibilities. But I never had that. I just, it was just tattooing and drawing and art, you know, day in, day out. I think I still hold on to a lot of anger. Maybe that anger sort of made me think, oh, I never want to get married. I don't want to have to experience that. However, 
I met a very wonderful woman, a very patient woman, and I'm happily married now. Working with Mike is pretty great. We get along really well. He does the art stuff and I do all the business stuff and he's pretty happy that way because now it's getting done and we've, we've come a long way, right? We've um, gone from sole proprietor to incorporated and, and it was a big learning curve for both of us, but I think we've sailed through it remarkably well. Mike works very hard and conscientiously. He gets up every morning. It's very important to have our daily ritual, walking around with the coffee, and checking out the critters and the trees and everything blooming. And that's our ritual. We do that every morning. And then he decides how long he needs to do the drawings. Um, and he maps that all out. And then when the people come, man, he's right on it. I never thought I'd be working in a tattoo shop. No, no, no. And my son actually said that to me the other day over the phone. He's like, I can't, I can't believe that you're working there. And to see you sitting there is so bizarre to me. Working together made sense. We work well together. Yeah, it was just sort of a vision. And I don't think the vision actually came together until Mike proposed. You know, and then it was like solidified. It's like, okay, I'm choosing to spend the rest of my life with Deb and let's create something together. There's something called the artist disease. Artists are prone to depression and anxiety, whether it's well-founded or not. And that's something that I've struggled with ever since I was probably 10. Two or three years ago now, I learned that I have like a chemical imbalance. So I take medication for it. It's not anything I'm ashamed of, but it can be really crippling if you don't know what's going on. The darkness kind of creeps in. It's not like you wake up one day and you're, you think, oh wow, my world just turned upside down. It sneaks in really slowly. He's had insecurity, self-doubt, one really bad bout of depression that, that I witnessed. It was a bit of a challenge. It was a very dark winter. I remember I, yeah, I just sat with him a lot. And he laid on the couch a lot. It was what he could do to get to work, do what he needed to do, then come home. It's kind of an invisible thing, you can't see it. You could look at somebody who's completely healthy, but they could be like seriously dealing with some sort of mental illness, but you, you can't see it, it's not, it's not a visible thing. And there's a stigma attached to mental health issues. I think a lot of people think you can't trust them or you have to be wary of them or they, they might harm you or they might harm themselves. But it, to me, it's just the same as being like a diabetic. You're born that way. There's things you can do. Lifestyle plays a big role. Medication helps and, and uh, therapy, talking to people, and having a good support network around you helps as well. People that believe in you. I wouldn't be where I am today without Debbie. And I think I'm becoming a better person. Debbie forces me to look at aspects of myself that I, that I don't like or I pretend aren't there. But I, I know that Debbie's helping me grow and improve. And it, it's, it's a two-way thing. It goes both ways. I would say we're a really good team because we do that for each other and um, we know each other very well and anticipate each other's needs. I'm doing really good these days. I can tell when they're coming and I know how to deal with it. I can work with it. I, I can fend it off. It, it can't take root. It can't get a hold of anything. So my, my bad days now are just like anybody's bad days. Somebody's an asshole to you or somebody <laughs> cuts you off or you know just stupid shit that really doesn't matter. I've been in different situations throughout life where things look really hopeless and dark, but I think when you realize that you're, you're not alone, you're not the only one, and things are, are never as bad as they seem to be, if you really hold on to that and understand it, you can get through just about anything. The happiness and contentment that I feel now is reminiscent of how I felt during the, the good times when I was a kid living on the farm. I plan on tattooing for as long as I can. I still love it and enjoy it. I'm still challenged by it. I used to say that it takes 10 years to become a tattooer. After 10 years, you'll have figured out the basics, but you're always learning. I think in order to be successful, you have to acknowledge the fact that you don't know everything and you have to be open to learning. I can learn stuff off people that have been tattooing for five years, and they can learn stuff off of me.
A perfect ending for me is just like this new phase, the Longwoods Trail that we've started. It, it's our vision and it provides, I guess, my two passions. I know I said I wasn't in love with tattooing, but maybe I am. I'm also in love with history. And those two things are gonna come together. I feel like I've sort of come back to my roots. It's funny, eh, like the, the, the road out there, Longwoods Trail, it's, it's the oldest trail in Canada. It goes back 11,000 years. And it's always been an important part of my life. When I was a kid out at the farm, I used to love to fall asleep listening to the trucks go up and down the Longwoods Road. And here I am tattooing next to the Longwoods Road in a tattoo shop that's named after the Longwoods Trail that's going to feature all sorts of artifacts that relate back to the trail. It's like it's my life, you know? It's, it's just come around and this, this is where I'm gonna, I'm gonna be here for the next 20 years. I'm only 50. I, I can I can tattoo till I'm 70 or 80. I, I'll be here in 30 years if I'm meant to be. And it's just gonna be just like it is now. It's gonna be awesome. Creating, watching the trees grow out there, raising bees and, and having little grandkids running around. That I'm looking forward to. Our first grandkid is on the way. And uh, it's, it's just a good place. It's where I belong. It's where I'm supposed to be.